Okay. Let's get this started. I am not looking my best today. But that's just how it's going to be. Um, I thought I'd do something different today. So, today we're going to be looking at computer stuff. Not very interesting, but it's my birthday, so I'm picking the subject. So, today I want to talk about a specific computer. But first, let's go through the history of computers. So, in the early times of computers, there were big computers. We're not talking about big computers today because they're mostly just big computers doing batch jobs and stuff. Nothing that uh, peasants like me could get hands on. No, not thick computers. Don't say thick computers. Anyway. Let's start off with basically the 80s onwards, or the 70s apparently. Um, this started with the Intel 4004. Um, probably one of the first microprocessors. It's a CPU. Um, what is a CPU? Probably good to talk about that first, right? Um, CPU can mean a lot of things. Um, generally these days, CPUs just have a whole bunch of different things in them, like the physical chips. They have like GPUs, and they uh, uh, have video encoders and decoders. But the important thing to think about CPUs is the fact that they have general purpose, like encoders and GPUs for the most part. They um, do a few things and they do them fast and they're very specific things. Gold spikes that you put... I don't know what you wrote. You censored it, but... Okay. I Maybe my mind's not awful enough to uncensor that. So the cool thing about computers, in my opinion, is that you can tell them to do like a series of steps and read things from memory and stuff like that. And this concept goes back to the Turing machine back in the 40s or the 30s. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. 1948. I guess. So getting distracted. First Intel CPU, because Intel is going to be the story today. Intel 404, 4004, 4004. It's a 4-bit computer. Did you know Alan Turing didn't kill himself and it was most likely an accident? I mean, I didn't look into it too much and I wasn't there, so... Eh. That sounds kind of heartless. So, the Intel 4004. The first microprocessor, really, to fit a general purpose CPU into a small commercial silicon chip. Um, this thing ran at 740 to 750 kilohertz. Yes, kilohertz. Uh, even the tiniest microcontroller these days just run at least a megahertz. But kilohertz. There were some other around. Uh, but this thing, tiny. And its basic thing, its function, was a calculator. So if we pull up a diagram, you can see it's basically 
the idea of what a computer is. Uh, not a computer, a CPU. Um, at the top we have a bus. Uh, the computer basically asks for fair an address on the bus or something like that, and it gets data in that way. Um, it has the accumulator unit, the ALU, and that does maths. And that's pretty much the core of most programs. Um, it can connect to RAM. That's good. It has 15 registers. That's a lot. Um, and it has a tiny address stack. So you could... The stack was not stored in memory. Well, the return stack. So if a program is doing something and it calls a subroutine, it needs to put where it left off in a stack. And since this stack is only like three levels deep, you can only go three levels deep. Um, which is a little bit silly, but also it's a four bit CPU. You're not gonna be needing much. Um, so yeah, it had 15 registers, program counter, all the kind of, you know, this is basically the bread and butter of any kind of um, CPU. Like, if we search up the CPU in my computer, Zen 2, we go to Wikichip, and we find a block diagram, if we can, if someone has diagrammed it. Here we go. Uh, it is it is optimized to basically turn uh, x86 instructions into um, stuff over here that does like there's the ALUs that does math and it has a physical register file of 180 and it has a whole bunch of other stuff to make your computer fast, like caches and um, scheduling, like out of order execution, all this advanced stuff. But the, the actual kind of programming model you get is you have this uh, ALU, you have some registers, and it works. So what's next? This thing shocked everyone, I guess. I don't know, I wasn't there. So let's jump to, I guess, the 4040. It had interrupts and low power standby. Sick. Interrupts are pretty cool. Just basically improving things. Um, goes faster. If we open the diagram here, you can see um, looks basically the same, but it has more uh, RAM ports at the front. But I think more registers. It has a banked registers. Um, that's kind of cool. All right, so next up. We got the uh, President Barack Obama awarded the designers for their work on the 4004. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, the, the issue isn't really making a computer at this point. It's making it small. So, the Intel... 8008. It is the same thing, but 8 bit. That's pretty cool. Let's look at the architecture. Uh, there's a lot more going on here. We have um, instruction decoders, address stacks. That's a bit higher, I think 8. Um, you can see that it's got a clock generator too. Um,
it looks basically the same to my eyes, but it has pretty much the common theme here is that whenever you're making a chip go faster or bigger, you're going to put more registers or cache or more components into the chip. Because modular computer systems with lots of chips just turn out to be kind of a bad idea for performance because, you know, the speed of light only goes so fast. And that's why to this day, most issues with computer speed are with accessing memory. Your computer is much, much, much faster than memory. And so it takes a while to ask things from memory. And uh, while your computer is waiting for the response back, it just does nothing. And there's a whole bunch of ways to work around this by adding uh, caches to kind of put some memory in the CPU itself. We simply make the speed of light go faster, taps temple. Yeah, that'd be pretty good. If you could go faster than the speed of light, I think the first use for that would maybe be computers? I mean, I know there's, like, thoughts about space travel, but just going faster than the speed of light just for, like, information transfer is the cool stuff. So, I think around this time... Yeah, so, simple stuff still. Then you get the Intel 8080. Um, pretty cool. This is the thing that kind of started all the home computer stuff. Um, if we look at the microarchitecture, uh, you'll notice something different. There's less registers. Um, you get like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe eight registers. Yep. I think that's it. Or here it says seven registers. Okay, that sucks. Um, and that's pretty cool. This this CPU, there's a lot of mileage out of it. Uh, there were Soviet clones, there were AMD clones, there were Zilog clones. People were using this to make, like, uh, which home computers used the Z80? Um, I think the first PC did. No, the, the first PC uh, used the next generation. Um, I know that the Game Boy used a variant of the Z80. The first kind of home computer, the MITS Altair 8800, used the 8080 at 2 MHz. Uh, the picture I'm showing here just shows, like, a kind of glassy box with, like, a dozen cards inside it. One of the cards would be for RAM. One of the cards would be, I don't know, for every component of the computer. Then you have the registers at the front. You can see the actual um, register bits, like uh, D0 to D7, A0 to A7. It's pretty cool. Um, and that led to Microsoft. This thing only cost like three thousand dollars. So this 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 started it all. So where do you go from there? That feel when you'll never be born in the seventies, please no. So, next up. Um, let's scroll down a bit because the story that you get here is a little bit different than the one I wanted to share today. So, you can see the next up. It's the 8086. The 8086. This thing ran DOS. It did a whole bunch of stuff. This is where things got real. Intel pulling its classic trick. They took their formerly 4-bit 
currently 8-bit CPU and turned it into a 16-bit CPU. Um, they just called the, all the registers, like, they put an X at the end to say it was extended. Um, you know, basic stuff, I guess. Don't break what's bro what doesn't break. Don't break what works. Um, pretty cool. But you'll see something interesting. It's actually called... Well, it was called the IAPX86. What? That's a bit weird. Let's continue on. Where do you go? If you're at... 16 bits in your CPU, where do you go? Well, you spend more time doing 16-bit stuff. But then you go to the 386. And that is the same thing, but it's got 32-bit registers. It's called EAX, EBX, ECD, ECD, ECX, EDX. So, You kind of only have like somehow they've lost registers at this point. You have EAX through EDX, that's four registers. Then you have like maybe two more you can actually use, and you have like six registers. And uh, that's kind of trashy. It works though, it became uh, the 32 bit x86 architecture. And uh, that's how we got Linux and Windows 95 and stuff. And the architecture there looks completely different. Did anything happen in between? Let's have a look. Well, we had 64-bit stuff. Um, but I'll get to that in a bit. If you look closely here, you do actually see some more Intel stuff. You see... The i960. And I think the i860. Which are kind of weird. Um, Intel's working on their 386, and they release another CPU as well. Intel's working on their 486, and they're releasing another CPU next to it. Um, no mention of the IAPX432, so let's kind of get into that now. I think this is kind of a black sheep. I'm not sure. It's not on the page here, so I guess it's not part of the history of computing hardware. But if we look at a little bit of the history here, we look at the i960. It's based on the IAPX432. And so you kind of learn that late 70s um, instead of doing the 8086, like extending it to 16-bit, Intel planned to do a 32-bit processor, and they released it in 1981. But then they kept releasing their 16-bit and then 32-bit processors, and then they released their i860 and i960, so you kind of have these weird um, this weird comp competition within Intel between people working on like the the x86 family and then you have the IAPX and the i960 and the i860 So what is the IAPX 432. Um, there's a lot of talk here on the page. So let's read a little bit of the summary. 
the IAPX432 was referred to as a micro mainframe designed to be programmed entirely in high-level languages. The instruction set architecture was new, significantly different, and it was a stack machine with no registers or no visible ones. It had object-oriented programming, garbage collection, multitasking, memory management directly in hardware and microcode, high-level data structures, um, an OS that was written entirely in Ada, which was kind of a high-level language back then, or it still is. It had a capability architecture, which meant memory safety. Um, a rogue program couldn't access memory that it wasn't allowed to access. This is something that computers are still struggling with this day. to this day. They still have... Um, this is driving projects like Rust. Um, but this was able to kind of create a little world inside the computer that had uh, objects and security boundaries and high-level things. Um, which is insane, right? You can kind of think of this as Java before Java. Java provides some of the same type of models. There's other languages too. Um, this is not the Java that I want. But Java kind of has this um, object-oriented, secure architecture, whatever, and it's designed to run on embedded systems, have automatic memories. Um, but this this architecture was ahead of its time. Um, it just, it was too big um, to, to fit on chips, basically. I think that's what I'm getting from it. Um, it's a fantastic idea, I think. It's fairly alien, and we're going to get right into it. Don't worry. Um, but it just... It didn't happen. Um, what, what is interesting is that it didn't happen so much that there's no remaining CPUs of this. They're all gone somewhere. Um, I don't know where. They were manufactured from 81 to 85. Um, we have a lot of documentation about it, which we'll go through. You know, these existed. People did play with them, but they're gone somewhere. So if you have one of these, please, uh, please tell, please show. Anyway, there's a lot to get into, but let's just continue on and look at the CPU that followed it. Give it to me. No. Um, let's look. So they went to kind of a RISC architecture next. The i960 was kind of salvaging the IAPX432. Um, and instead of doing putting everything in the chip, they instead went kind of a RISC design um, with some extra things in it to help make an object-oriented system. Um, it had the ability to tag memory, which would allow memory protection in hardware. Um, this is something most, if not, I wouldn't say all, most CPUs these days do not have memory tagging. And it's a kind of elegant solution um, to, like, the idea but behind memory tagging, which I'll quickly pop up, is that the CPU, the actual hardware, if I can find, is there anything on Wikipedia about this? Tagged architecture. 
Okay, so there's basically nothing. Um, so the idea is that uh, in your computer, you access memory using addresses. And a key problem is that you can just forge addresses and then access them um, within a single program. Let me get this light down a bit. Oh, that's so bright. That's even worse. Okay, I'm putting it back. I made a mistake. Oh, that's too bright for my eyes. Okay. So, instead of being able to forge memory addresses, the CPU just puts a little um, extra bit on it, saying this is a memory address. Um, and that's it. The CPU, uh, it, it manages the memory addresses you can create. And that means that you can't, like, access memory by accident. Uh, or on purpose that you're not allowed to. And it's a fairly elegant design. I think ARM has support for it. ARM64. Um, yeah, there's really not that much stuff on it. Uh, so, back to the i960. Um... Apparently, competition came from the x86 camp in Intel. Maybe. It says dubious discuss and citation needed. Um, so what happened next? They had the i860, which was a very long instruction width one. So, very long instruction width is kind of a strange type of CPU. Um, instead of being able to do one, like, math thing at a time, um, you just do, like, multiple. Um, which is fine. Like, the com you explicitly make it so the computer can do multiple things at a time. You say... You have certain amounts of lanes, and you can tell the computer to do this thing with this part of the computer, and another thing with this part of the computer. And you can do it in multiple lanes. Um, but the, the main issue with that is that um, you have to have, no one wants to do that, probably. So, compilers are supposed to like manage what goes where, which lanes. Um, Intel did try this again with um, with the Itanium architecture. So this is Intel's first 64-bit CPU called Itanium. Um, it's a very long instruction width. Um, they called it explicitly parallel instruction computing. Um, and this didn't happen. It didn't work out. Um, because it turns out, again, you know, compilers can't really... Well, people haven't written smart compilers. And no one wants to program these manually. Um, what's actually happened is computers do do multiple things at a time now, but they use um, out-of-order execution. Where they take the list of instructions as they come in, and then they kind of split them, split them into different pipelines, and then complete them. Um, and that's how... 
CPUs work now, most of the time. Um, and on top of that, you have speculative execution, where the CPUs will now just, you know, do work um, that they don't have to do because, um, you know, what ends what end up what ends up happening is that if the computer sees like a branch where it has to do thing A or thing B, it'll do like the one that it thinks is going to happen. Um, speculatively, um, just because it's like, well, we're just going to be waiting for an answer back from RAM as to whether we're going to do this. So we might as well do this while we're waiting. And if it turns out to be wrong, we'll just trash it and do the other thing. So that kind of hides a lot of RAM latency. And it works pretty well. Creates a lot of security bugs, but meh. So anyway, let's go back to the IAPX 432. We're going to head on over to Brouhaha's website for the IAPX 432. Maybe the only website on the internet about it. This is I think the only guy that cares, I'm not sure. Um, there was a Usenet group, and it was deleted. Um, it's very difficult to find anything about this. If if anybody has anything related to this, chips, boards, systems, software, manuals, schematics, documentation, archives, anything related, send it to this guy. Um, he does not have enough things to, like, even, you know, boot a system. So we learn a bit more about how the APX actually works here, with components. Uh, there's the 43201 and the 430, 43202, which form to the general data processor and the single chip interface processor. Um, then there's some more chips. And we'll get to see how they work in a bit. Um, then there's talks about the releases. There was uh, three major releases. That's pretty cool. There's a list of different documentations um, that this guy has or knows about. Um, there's a specific evaluation piece of hardware called the ISBC 432-100. Um, nobody got it. Oh, um, he has a board, an evaluation board, but it's missing all the chips. Um, so, yeah, not great for actually having things. Um, some software on tape. But that's about it. So, let's quickly check YouTube to see if there's anything about the IAPX 432 on it. Before we dive in. Nope. Nothing. There's nothing. Nobody knows anything about this. Um, except IMAX 432 top number 9 facts. Anyway. So we've hit the 40 minute mark almost. Let us dive in to some light material. Um, let's read the sales pitch. If we go to bitsavers.org, there's actually some PDFs um, in this directory. Pretty cool. So we're going to read some. 
And that's basically going to be the rest of the stream. I've skimmed some of these, but it's going to be pretty cool. So I hope you're ready to read with me. So, Intel 432 System Summary Manager's Perspective. So, I wrote this down in my notes as a sales pitch. So, it's a series of booklets that introduces project managers and technical staff to the Intel 432 Micro Mainframe family. This material is broader in scope and shallower in depth. It's not intended to teach anything, but to introduce the uh, topics surrounding it. Um, it lists um, various different uh, booklets. There's a 432 system summary, manager's perspective, system summary, software engineer's perspective, system summary, hardware engineer's perspective, and... Uh, I don't think we have those. Let me check. I think there's only the summary here for the manager's perspective. Yep. So that's what we got. So let's scroll down and look at introduction. It is a microcomputer. Original equipment manufacturers, so this would be like Dell or IBM, would use this chip as part of the larger products they build. End products may be office automation work, stations, factory information systems, telephone systems, transaction processing, families of general processing, general purpose computers, and the 432 engine at the heart of such a product will often be imperceptible to the user. It's aimed at a distinctive class of applications, um, a range of performance, maximum dependability, uh, software development. Um, I think it's worth bringing up there that around this time, software complexity, a lot of what built the IAPX is software complexity, which was kind of spiraling out of control at the time. This is why high-level languages were so important. Um, people kept writing in assembly, and then you wouldn't be able to move the code to another machine. Which is why this thing looks an awful lot like Java. This is addressing the same issue of we need to be able to have software that moves between different types of machines. Concurrent execution, growth and evolution. This is the kind of stuff you expect nowadays in a concurrent operating system like Linux or Windows. Um, so this is marketed as a micro mainframe. The goal of the 432 is to significant. Why is it so bright outside? Hang on. Okay. Significantly reduce the life cycle costs of complex microcomputer applications. So they want the best of both worlds. They want tiny computers, but they also want to be able to write programs that are portable, um, complicated, um, in a good way, like concurrency. So, all 432-based systems share the oper overall organization depicted in figure one. So let's go down here and have a look at the kind of schematic we get here, the block diagram. And you can see something extremely interesting here, is that this isn't just a single processor system, this is intended to be multiple processors. You have a pool of memory, 
you have a general data processor, then you have an interconnect with the processor in memory, then you have an interface processor, and then peripheral subsystems. And then you just have this bus connect to all of that. That's pretty cool, right? That's uh, parallel processing. That's fault tolerance. If one of the CPUs goes down, it can migrate away as long as you still have you know, memory and buses and stuff like that. Um, you also see this separation between general data processes and interface processes. So, uh, what's a good explanation? The data processor would just be your application that wants to compute stuff and then send commands like ask for input, get input back. And then the interface processor would effectively be the operating system. Um, and so you don't have a situation where you have drivers or anything. Or you do, but the drivers or the kernel or whatever kind of actual you know, real world stuff will be hitting this interface processor that would be specifically designed to talk to I.O. and stuff. And so developers could just live in this kind of 432 general data processor land. The central system supports up to 16 megabytes of real memory and a virtual memory space of over a trillion bytes. So 2 to the power of 40 Let's quickly calculate that. How many megabytes is that? Let us start with 2 to 24. 16 megabytes. What about 2 to the power of 40? So that would be a terabyte of memory, a terabyte of virtual memory. So this is interesting, isn't it? Um, the address space is not 32-bit like you would expect that only goes up to 4 gigabytes. It's 2 to the power of 40 that goes up to a terabyte of memory. Um, in fact, I think it was too advanced. They had to kill it. Um, the actual current 64-bit um, addressing scheme used in 64-bit uh, x86 machines is 2 to the power of 48. That goes up to 256 terabytes of storage. I'm on a list now. Yeah. So... What's interesting here is it says, no bus design could possibly satisfy the cost, size, flexibility, and performance requirements of all possible system configurations. Therefore, it defines a processor slash memory communications protocol. And it uses packets. So instead of the CPU putting something on the bus, like a command and an address, and then something else on the bus reading it, and saying, that's for me. I'll just replace the value and send it back to the CPU. It uses packets like um, Ethernet, routing, IP stuff. Which is fascinating to me. Because computers don't do that. Um, if you look at... Let me try and find... The reference manual for um, the microcontroller I'm using in a project. Um, if you look here, you don't actually have a packet system. Um, you have an interconnect. And I believe this is all using a bus. All the components in the computer are kind of connected to each other. Not on one interconnect, but each of them have specific direct routes to each other. 
So for example, the CPU is able to access directly the RAM, um, the peripherals indirectly, flash, sysram, ROM, but it can't directly access um, things like USB or SD stuff. It has to go through um, another matrix for that, I think. So there's no packets here. Instead you have, um, I guess, just addresses and stuff. Like, there's a memory map. If we scroll down. Yeah, so this uses a NIC 4000 interconnect. Um, and that's not packet based, I believe. Network interconnect. I might be wrong. Network sounds kind of packet based, right? Um, why you take so long to load? It doesn't seem to explain if it's packet based, but I would assume not. Functional description. Let's hit there. Interfaces. This uses master and slave terminology, which isn't great. Yeah, so you have an address width and you have data width and you have some signals and stuff but it's not protocol based it's more of a bus system so let's continue on independent decentralized io um, are dedicated to peripheral subsystems. These are autonomous satellite computers attached to the central system by means of 432 interface processes. And again, you can add as many as you want. So now let's learn about the GDP. 64 pin chips, and these are the processing bases. They combine mainframe computer functionality data types, addressing modes, um, basic instruction set with the form factor, power requirements, and cost characteristics of a microcontroller. So now we see a kind of black and white picture of them. I can't actually make anything out, but to my eyes, it doesn't look like a, like, um, a little pin thing. It looks like a system on a module. Um, what I can see here is that, uh, how do I explain this? Um, if I search up um, system on a chip, um, if I search it up properly, you get things like this. You get the MSP430 and it's got uh, like the black epoxy around the die and you have pins, and then those get soldered or connected to things. Um, but this doesn't look like that. That just looks like there's a circuit board with pins at the side. And that looks more like a system on a module. Let's search that up. And let's see if I can find something that looks kind of the same. Um, possibly what I'm thinking of is um, this, this type of thing. So you have this PCB and you have pins at the side that are underneath it that go into a socket. Except this seems to be upside down or the chips and stuff are covered. It looks to be at a height where I think it's kind of all the chips are underneath the PCB. So that's what I'm seeing from that. 
I'm not sure. It's a very old photo and it's black and white. So what data types does it have? Character. 16, 32-bit signed and unsigned integers. 32-bit, 64-bit or 80-bit floating point. That's pretty impressive. Um, addressing modes. This is where things get kind of interesting. Because you have your data types, you have your addressing modes, but you're not addressing by, by the actual um, memory addresses, I don't think. You're addressing by um, objects. So, scalar, stack top, record element, static vector element, dynamic vector element. So, instead of saying, I need to access this part in memory using a pointer, you would, ac you would say, I need to access this value of this object. Which is pretty fascinating. It has data transfer, move, save, zero, one. Uh, arithmetic, logical comparison, branch, call, call with message return, um, extract, insert, significant bit. I'm interested in this call, call with message and return. That seems like it would be analogous to the um, x86 thing, like uh, call another function. But this call with message thing seems a little bit strange because it implies you can't pass any like variables or any data with a call. So maybe we'll learn a bit about that later. Has high level instructions for communication, creating data, locking objects, uh, protection. So you can protect objects by restricting rights and, also, and uh, doing access control and stuff. So if you want some private data, you can keep it just to that part of the program. Um, automatically, it does dispatching, scheduling, message synchronization, and queuing, which is kind of what a real-time operating system would do. So protection here. Need to know addressing at data structure level. Attempted violations detected and reported by hardware. Automatic detection of processor hardware errors when processors are configured in self-checking pairs. That's fascinating. It doesn't dive into what uh, processor hardware errors mean, but I assume it runs self-tests in on one processor from another. And now we have some timing data. Um, so a processor cycle takes, uh, 0.1, I think that's a microsecond or nanosecond. That always confuses me. Um, you have some kind of ridiculous numbers over here, like integers, um, dividing is like, 10 cycle, uh, 10 nanoseconds or microseconds or whatever. Thanks, Cogamer Micro. Hi. Power requirement. Wait, is this just for the chip? 2.5 watts for the chip? Yikes. If it was nano, it would use the N symbol instead of the MU signal. Right, right. 2.5 watts for a chip. Um, <clears throat> that's not great, but can but it might not be like. Let's just search up Intel AD86 power usage. It required 350 milliamps, and on five volts that would be um, 0. 3, 5 times 5. That's around 2 watts. So, then we get to the next part of this. We have some cool hardware. It's a bit like Java. Next we have 
Compared to a conventional processor, the GDP absorbs into hardware many functions that are customarily performed by the applications and system software. For example, the GDP provides hardware operations on floating numbers in its basic instruction set. Implementing these in hardware perform improves performance. Um, less obvious effects are the simplification and improved reliability, reliability of software. So that's pretty cool. That's the idea you have of having any kind of instruction set. You have um, instructions that the hardware can do, and they'll do it right most of the time. Um, and that's a good contract. But the GDP goes higher. Um, this adds high level instructions. And this is kind of where things get a bit off the rails because it implements high level like um, functions and stuff in hardware. Um, so an example of that would be like uh, if you have, I'm not sure what an example is, we'll probably see one in a bit. Here's another picture of the chip. Um, it does look like it's socketed upside down. So now we learn about the interface processor. Acting as an intelligent adapter, the interface processor permits a peripheral subsystem to direct data transfers across the system boundary. And this is necessary because if you have a world of like objects and nice data structures, um, that's cool, but you need to be able to like actually do things in the real world. You need to be like able to send bytes to a keyboard controller. And instead of having software do this, um, they have a processor do this. Um, and that's pretty cool because it means that the, you know, the CPUs can keep running. They don't get interrupted by this. And this thing dispatches and messages, uh, dispatches and I would guess take messages and serialize and unserialize them. Um, and you can kind of see where things are starting to go a little bit wrong here. Um, because probably the first rule of what I've learned is you don't want to be doing much in hardware if you can. Because once it is shipped, you can't fix it. So doing things in software as much as possible is good. It could be possible, it's almost probable, that this has some kind of firmware on it. Um, but would it be updatable firmware? Probably not. That'd be a waste of chip space. Um, or it might. It might have EEPROM. So, data transfers are performed by means of four IP data paths called windows. Each window <laughs> exposes one data structure in central system memory. Peripheral subsystem software can switch a window to a different data structure. Um, to an agent in the peripheral system, a window is just a range of memory addresses. Writing into these addresses writes into the exposed data structure and reading from these addresses obtains structure from the data structure. Data from the data structure. So this kind of maps, I guess, hardware registers into objects. That's pretty cool. Um, let's see. It can address the same amount of stuff. It transfers bytes and double bytes. Um, can transfer randomly or in blocks up to 64K long. That's pretty cool. Um, it has equivalent commands for sending, receiving, locking objects. Um, it automatically does message synchronization and queuing. Um, has the same protection. Also runs at 2.5 watts. Um, so you've uh, ooh, you've got about 
maybe five watts there already and you haven't even got a, uh, a system booted not that great okay let's continue on we have some more pictures and we see one of the first systems system 432 slash 600 and these are building blocks from which you can build a computer um <laughs> I'm not sure if that's italic or not, but it says um, it utilizes the multiprocessor capabilities of the 432 to provide a set of building blocks that can be configured with unusual flexibility. <laughs> okay. So you mix pro uh, chips to make, you know, if you want more IO power, you add more interface chips and subsystems and whatever. Um, you get storage array boards of 128k bytes and 256k bytes uh, matching of memory up to a total of 4 megabytes of system storage. Which, that's pretty good, right? Like, um, that's well above the 640k um, limit that uh, 8086 would have. In addition, these board components, the 432600, offers diagnostic software, card cages and backplanes, and a powered and cooled enclosure. That's pretty cool. So let's look at the system overall here. We have a specification summary. Um, basically what we just read. Uh, up to 4 megabyte of memory. Um... Interestingly, it has error checking memory, and each byte in the bus is parity checked. Um, it has a lot of checking for the system. Um, there's a reference to IAPX86 slash 88 based peripheral subsystems. So I'm guessing you can connect these to like a 8086 machine. So let's scroll down more. And so we see what we would kind of write for this computer. We would write magical nice adder code. That's pretty cool. But let's skip that because we know what that's basically modern programming. Um, let's scroll down and let's look at the operating system. It's called the IMAX. So this operating system runs on both the central system and peripheral subsystems. And you configure IMAX services into their own systems and you can replace your own modules. It's a very modular system. And we have a diagram here where we have the central system containing, you know, basic process services, IO services, process communication services, storage services, extended type services, and those are split into the peripheral subsystems with the IO controller, um, IO monitors, and that connects to printers or terminals or custom devices. And then you have user modules at the other end that connect to the central system basic processes. Um, I'm not sure why this is oriented this way, because this looks a bit like a stack from low level you know stuff to high level where you have terminals and you have your io controller then you have your storage devices then you have your basic services and stuff it's all made with adder um it has process creation destruction and control uh lots of really cool stuff here you know, you have terminals. Uh, it uses an initial central system memory image. That's pretty cool. And then we get the summary here. Um, the Intel 432 is a comp comprehensive family of products embracing chip and board level hardware components. That's pretty cool. So, what else is what else is here? We have some 
we have some stuff to try and sell us and talk about why pyramid structuring. What? Did I say pyramid structuring? We have some stuff to sell us here. Fuel fields are more dynamic and innovative than computing. New computers and lines of computers are introduced almost weekly. Yet at the same time, sampling a set of contemporary machines, even across manufacturers and classes, micro, mini, or mainframe, reveals a surprising resemblance in their basic designs. And so we get a chart that shows us <laughs> this, this chart. Oh, this is a great chart. Oh, I'm so happy. So we have a chart that structure of the computer system pyramid. Um, yeah, you can think of it kind of as a pyramid, but usually um, there's another diagram I'll get to later on, but you know, I don't blame you if you tap out of this. But usually you have um, a stack of stuff where it goes from real world stuff all the way up to like fancy, you know, abstractions and ideas that are in the computer. Um, but this looks like it's just that, but sideways. Anyway, let's look at this graph. So we have a graph and the up axis is state of the art. Um, and we have various different lines on the graph. We have, well, we have three sections, IBM mainframes, DEC mini computers, Intel microprocessors. And then on the graph, we have various lines that are called conceptual bases. I don't know what that means. Um, I guess, I, I think what this is trying to, I think what this is trying to explain is how low level things are, how much the har hardware would do for you. And then it shows how that's innovated. And gradual innovation is just like releasing new versions of chips. And then it has this thing called quantum innovation that just goes all the way up. So let me describe this. IBM goes from the 7090, gradual to 7094. Then it quantumly innovates up to the IBM 360, then the 370, and it gradually, you know, 303X, 4300, 3081, then goes onwards. Um, and the quantum, the conceptual base there is at 360. DEC has a weirder base. It has, it goes, it starts at the PDP-8, then gradually goes up, you know, the 8 series. Then it jumps quantumly from the 8 to the PDP-11, which is what Unix was made on. So I guess the idea there is that, you know, can run operating systems. And then it gradually goes back up to the PDP 11, uh, 70, then it go, then it does like a quantum innovation jump up to the VAX 11 and that has a conceptual base. And then for Intel, we have a conceptual base starting at the 8080, it hits the 8085. Um, then it does a quantum innovation to the 8086 and the 8088. And then it does gradual innovation, but it has like just a straight line going up and to the right. That says, you know, the, the 186, the 286. But next to that line is just like, it goes off the chart basically compared to everything else. It goes up quantum innovation all the way up to the Intel 432. And it's at its conceptual base there at the top of the graph. And it has a little arrow saying gradual innovation. And I feel kind of bad now because I know that that arrow, that arrow is going, it's not going anywhere. Oh boy. And then we have some, uh, we have some talk. Uh, it's a quantum innovation in computing. Um, delivers a 32 bit computer. Wow. Um, What have we learned from the development of today's mainframe operating systems? The record is not encouraging. 
many of these systems have never seen the light of day, having been aborted when it became apparent that they could not possibly satisfy their objectives. Uh-oh. Pretty, pretty bold move to write that. Um, so now we learn about how the IAPX can solve your software development. You know, what is effective performance? How effective is a system that adds integers in a microsecond, but requires a thousand times as long to add real numbers? A <laughs> look at computer chip bloopers? Yeah, this is basically um, Intel's dead-end architecture that uh, is not even listed on the Wikipedia computer history page because no one cares about it. Um, so we talk about, you know, how effective is stuff. This is good performance. Um, <laughs> rather than implement a raft of clever new instructions, the 432 moves proven high payoff functions into hardware. Um, x86 did, did uh, the opposite. You can basically read all of this as, you know, ranting against x86. Um, being smug about the x86 being trash and then just being wiped from existence. Um, let's see. Let's scroll down a little bit. We see some scheduling. We see multi-process scheduling. That's pretty cool. Distributed input output. Future of performance. I have some spoilers about the performance for this chip, but we'll get to that in a bit. Um, mainframe based programs experience with them has shown repeatedly that large software systems are among the most difficult engineering projects that men and women undertake. Um, it's pretty woke. 1970s work, sorry, 1980s work to write men and women because, uh, I mean, it's hard to say how woke it is because programming started off as a women's thing and then it kind of became a men's thing. Uh, the first programmers were women. Um, it was just... <laughs> It was just seen as, like, um, boring stuff. Um, you know, it was work. It died because it got cancelled. Um, so we see more stuff here. We see, we see dreaded words here. Compiler-oriented machine. Yeah, it started out as a women thing. Um, like, if we search up computer person in brackets... Um, before computers existed, you had women that actually sat down and did freaking maths everywhere. Um, basically, being computer people. That's pretty cool. Um, and then it, it moved into, I think... Ah, what was it? I mean, one of the first programmers was arguably um, Ada Lovelace. She wrote an algorithm for the analytical computer that didn't get made. That's kind of cool. That's who um, the Ada language is named after. Uh, I want to find a picture, yeah. Um, during the war, they worked on the bomb machine. Woman made computers. Yeah. Um, oh, freaking segregation. They segregated even this. That's trash. Um, 
back when the the first early I think analog computers, you'd have the women programming things by crawling through underneath computers and connecting cables to set like ones and zeros. I imagine. Um, probably, yeah. Probably the biggest influence was um, Grace Hopper, who invented like compilers like high level languages instead of writing like assembly all the time um she was like hey why don't we write a programming language that was in english and so she invented COBOL, which was pretty sick grace hopper did all the cool shit um Inventing bugs, the terms bug and debugging when a moth caused. Um, start as a job for women and end up being one of the most well paid jobs in a male dominated field. Yeah, that's why I'm like, kind of like, oh, that's another one. Mar Margaret Hamilton, she wrote, I think she wrote, yeah, she programmed the onboard software for the Apollo mission computers. That's pretty sick. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out how to work this out because we see in the 1990s here, it says by the 1990s computer, computing was dominated by men. The proportion of female computer science graduates peaked in 1984 around 37% and just steadily declined. Um, but it's like... So how work is this really? Is it just this is before things got really, really bad for women with computers? Like, not, it's always been bad. Being a woman has always been bad. But um, how, how bad was it? Because if you see, if you say men and women there, um, depending on the time, it might have been, you know, things were just not fine, but also not complete trash. So yeah, that's my little confusion about that. Um, I, I think basically the idea um, from all this is that when computer programming became cool, men started taking it up and it became a men, a boys thing. Um, but when it was just work, Glass ceiling bad, yeah. Um, but it is nice they wrote that. Um, they didn't write NBs though, so. Ugh. Um, but compiler oriented machine is a theme with Intel, and uh, it doesn't usually go well. Compilers are not that smart. Um, Let's see. Modular programming language. That's pretty cool. Um, they're showing here how um, you decompose programs. Uh, which is kind of basically what everyone does now. This is like way before my time so when people weren't able to do things like this but most people write code like this um it, it was a lot harder to write code like this when you're on a 8-bit computer without lots of memory um, because when every byte counts you have all those overheads that come from partitioning your program into multiple pieces um, I wonder if they bring up, no, so what seems to happen with, when you start modularizing programs is that all the, like, pro sub programs and interconnects and stuff tend to happen along, um, organizational boundaries, um, let's search that up. I 
this has fascinated me. Conway's law, any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Um, which makes sense, doesn't it? Because, you know, you don't want everyone to know everything. So however you organize people, that's how they're going to feed information to each other, and the computer mimics that. So, we learn a bit more about that. We learn about packages. Defines both a data structure and a set of operations. So that sounds like a class, almost, in Java terms. Um, a lot of cool stuff here. Modular Applications Executive. Is that what IMAX stands for? Modular Applications Executive. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, and it contains components and off-the-shelf stuff. That's pretty cool. That's like an operating system. Um, but unlike an operating system, it's actually kind of written... When you write a computer program these days, and you want to communicate with another computer programmer, you don't easily have the ability to just send messages and stuff. That's still a, a hella issue, as they say. Um, you don't have this kind of transparent ability to talk to things in the same kind of tongue. You have to bind things. Um, and we have an interesting thing here, concurrent programming and execution, and we have um, what looks like us trying, trying to show us how scheduling works. So we have sequential execution, we have three, blo blo three blocks of a program, three programs, and they run in um, one after another, apparent concurrent execution. A single processor is multiplexed among multiple programs, only one runs at a time. That's kind of what happens in most systems these days. Um, and then you have true concurrent execution, multiple processors execute multiple programs in parallel. And um, I'm actually interested, do they do a mix of those? Because what ends up happening on modern machines is uh, the system will try and do multiple concurrent execution, but it will also do the middle one where it just goes all over the place if it has to. Um, let's scroll down. Request for readers' comments. The dependability challenge. This is an interesting observation. Um, you need to have things to be dependable. As it says, a microcomputer's I.O. devices may include not only disks and terminals, but also furnaces, kidney machines, radar displays, and expensive equipment. Unlike most mini computers and mainframes, micros usually find themselves installed far from personnel who can diagnose and repair a piece of hardware, not to mention fix a program bug. Do you think if you could send that in, they'd answer back? I don't know. Does anyone want to try it? So, how... Oh, they don't give much information here. How that works. With software dependability these days, mostly you're either going to write code that's correct and hope not to have bugs, or write code that's going to be able to fail gracefully. Sorry, this building is now an empty field. Yeah. Reliable floating point arithmetic. This is very interesting, actually. Um, it says it implements the proposed IEEE standard for micro slash mini computer binary floating point arithmetic. 
um, which is the standard, basically, all computers with floating point stuff used now. Uh, context, floating point means decimal numbers. Um, decimal numbers in computers are difficult and horror, horror stories. Um, but, you know, there was standardization on how to do them. Compile time checking, that's pretty cool. That's done nowadays a lot. Module version checking, that's interesting. Um, figure 16 illustrates a common scenario and shows how the 432 linker detects the difference. This reference here before the mismodified program gets uh, done, uh, linked wrong. So it has kind of uh, version checking for modules, which is nice. I imagine Java has that. Runtime protection in hardware. It talks about how it's impossible to demonstrate that the system fully works. That's technically true and also practically true. Um, so they're kind of talking about memory safety. And we have a fascinating diagram here of how memory works in the 432. So instead of just being able to read or write to an address, um, you specify, um, hang on, how does this, I'm trying to see how this works. There's a big table of descriptors that has the type, the length, and the address. So this is a list of all the objects in the computer, I imagine, or at least in a module. It has the permissions for um, which module can read what. And then the procedures themselves have the permissions. So this is interesting because it means you can lock objects and whatever specifically to um, procedure, function granular, granularity. And this is called uh, memory capability addressing. And if we look, I think it's here. Here we go. There's a... Uh, there's a website that talks about this. Um, this was popular. Um, System 250 used it. System 38 used it. Sorry, not popular. This was unpopular. But it seems to be coming back with memory um, tagging and stuff like that. So that's probably the thing that fascinates the most about me with this because it allows security within a program and able to define more granular boundaries. Um, so we scroll past that, and it talks about how good that is. Believe me, that's a good thing. Let's look at self-checking processes. So it talks about coping with hardware. I wonder how much architecture has been designed by women you mean like computer architecture or physical architecture? Yeah, all right, computer. That's a good question. I'm sure I could read it if I uh, went to the women in computing tab that I closed. So how does it figure out faults? It adds cyclic redundancy checks, error checking, and correction. So it just wants to detect bit flips, which is fascinating. Um, so I'm guessing the processor just double checks everything. Wow. 
built-in circuits that permit two processors to be wired together in a cell, single self-checking module. The module monitors itself cycle by cycle, performing every operation in parallel and comparing the results. If it cannot guarantee the correct operation, the module stops itself in the next cycle and notifies the rest of the system. So you turn two CPUs into one and compare their results. Um, and if it's wrong, it marks it as failed. That's pretty cool. I haven't seen that used in any modern systems. I don't think you can do that. Of course, things are a bit more complex nowadays, but that is fascinating. We have a summary today, summary of this, and it tells us all the stuff we've learned. Is there an order form at the bottom of the page? Nope. I'll... Sales offices. Oh, that's cool. There's a lot of offices for sales. Anyway, so that's the overview. What do I have next? Um, did I look at the introduction? Um, let's see, how much time do I have today? Um, I don't want to open pirate websites for, um, scientific articles. So here's an introduction. Um, it's pretty dry, I think. Um, Let's have a look at the computer architecture place and memory organization. And we'll see where that goes. So now we have a stack here. We have a picture of a stack showing the computer architecture. And it goes from the gate level to the microcode to the instruction set to the operating system to the language to the system. And then outside world is at the top, which is kind of strange. So it tells us about all these separate things, which I assume we already know. And then a distributed system, um, it shows multiple of those diagrams at the side with runtime control for some of them. So that's just two CPUs with an IO processor. Um, Interestingly enough, computers these days don't really have an I.O. processor per se. They just, you know, use whichever processor is free to handle that kind of stuff. Um, depending if you balance the interrupts, I guess. And so, let's look at the architecture here. And we see this amazing graph that goes over the same things before. We see microcomputers. Um, I don't know what the, the X axis is for. It's unclear. Um, I'm guessing it's what it covers. So microcomputers cover some of the operating system, half the basic instruction set and all the hardware. Many computers go a bit higher with more of the instruction set. Mainframes go a bit higher too, with some more operating system, but the APX 432 goes, uh, it goes nuts. It, it goes all the instruction set, all the, well, most the operating system, most the high level language and most the applications. And they write here, raising the hardware to software interface. And you can kind of see that that is the overall goal here. They want you to write applications against the IAPX 432 itself. 
and have those be portable, I guess. And it compares things to conventional architectures, and they're like, we have more address space. Um, pages are like easier. Well, sorry, let me refer to this a bit better. Um, memory organization in most computers is linear, and you just have an address, but the IAPX 432 has segments. That's pretty cool. Um, protection memory unit, instead of being page-based, is module-based or data structure-based. It uses a stack for expressions. Um, its primitive data types include temporary reels. I don't know what that means. Let's see. Conventional mainframe architecture does not support multi-process um, dynamic storage allocation, uh, limited multi-processor operation, if any, um, assembly-oriented, and no programming methodology, methodology supported, while the IAPX does multiple process mechanisms and hardware, dynamic storage allocations, software transparent, multi-processor operation, oriented towards high-level languages and object-based architectures. And then we see a, uh, another image where we have uh, attached um, I.O. subsystems like peripheral or an 86 or a local storage going to the interface processor. And you can see where they define the interface processor. It, it's, it seems to be defined as changing between interrupt-driven I.O. processing and message-based, which makes sense. And it shows how you can have more of those. That talks about fundamentals. Um, it shows us how linear memory tends to work. You uh, pick some value from memory and it maps straight to physical memory. So like address 50,000 maps straight to 50,000. Um, but then you can have mapping for each program. So that programs can kind of only access their own data, which is what works today. This is what we use. Um, so program B has a few kilobytes of memory at the top of physical memory. Program A has some stuff at the bottom of physical memory, um, but through some addressing error or whatever, um, A manages to overwrite the physical memory because they both can access each other's memory. Um, then they add like mapping of stuff. This is where virtual memory comes into play, where uh, the memory isn't physical, it's virtual, and then applications can only access their own memory. Um, and yeah, it shows how you can run multiple programs with their own address spaces um, in a single physical address space. And in modern computers use page space mapping. So each program is made up of uh, four kilobyte pages, basically. Um, but the IAPX does not use pages. It uses segments. Um, and there are, you can see the logical address space linear memory is data A, uh, sorry, data B, data A, data main, procedure B, procedure A, main procedure. And then in segmented memory, um, the main procedure goes from 0 to 2000. Procedure A goes from 0 to 8000. So it's basically the same thing, except each procedure and data has its own virtual memory um, address space just for its use. Um, but then you want to map it. Um, so, like, if you want to use data from somewhere else, you have to map it into your own. And then it does that using a segment system with displacement and stuff. That's fine, I guess. 
Um, they don't want to call it segmented memory. They call it structured memory. Um, Two-step mapping. So they map through an access descriptor, then a segment descriptor. And they show a big graph how program memories have a logical address space of four gigabytes, um, which is a lot smaller than it said before, right? Then it has segments that can effectively address less than four gigabytes, then physical address space of like 16 megabytes. Like there's nothing really objectionable about this. You could complain it's a bit complicated, but like, that's virtual memory for you. It talks about the different um, value types. Um, temporary reels are 80-bit reels, I think. Huh, I suppose that's just a long reel. Yeah, temporary reels are like 19 decimal digits. Structurally, you have arrays, which is just like a, risk, a list of stuff, and records, which is like a, a table where you have names for things. Um, it talks about addressing modes. Not that interesting to me. Talks about modularity and security, um, concurrency, expandency, and we have all this kind of uh, explanation about how it's an object-based architecture and it uses segments um, on top of, like underneath the hood, objects are just data and access segments and all that. And when they point to each other, they, paint, they point to access segments. That's fine. That's pretty cool. I think it does garbage collection using domains. Not too sure. Oh, that's used for hiding private data. Um, there's a lot of just interesting stuff. So when you jump to a procedure, it has its own context, which means it can have its own data and stuff only accessible by that procedure or domain and things like that. And it's fascinating stuff. There's a, there's a lot of work spent in this um, memory and object architecture. And you can really tell just from how much they've written here. So, architectural support for system services, which they call the silicon operating system. And they talk about how they manage processes and process and memory um, objects. Let's look at a diagram. Um, and so you have a physical processor, then you have a processor carrier object, then a process object, then a context object, then a domain object. Um, and then it talks about inter-process communication without blocking, which would be, I guess, a message queue. Um, different types of communication. This is all fairly standard stuff, but not what you would expect on a actual piece of hardware. And if you zoom in here, you can see a picture of the IAPX processor, and it is indeed a module with a whole bunch of pins at the sides that you just kind of push in. That's pretty cool. And they talk about a summary here. Object-oriented design methodology has a great promise for solving many of the current problems in software design and maintenance.
based on information hiding as the criterion for modularization. Um, type managers are modules that result when the methodology is actually applied. Domain objects and context objects are used to implement the static structure and dynamic behavior of type managers. Multi-process operation can be supported by the object-based architecture and provides a uniform approach to all system services. And the silicon operating system provides a full set of hardware recognized system objects to provide support for concurrent processing, interprocessing, interprocess communication, and dynamic storage allocation. So you have this kind of big, thick processor um, board design where they throw a whole bunch of stuff in hardware. Um, it's pretty cool. What are we going to look at next? Uh, let's look at the system of 432 reference manual. This is a reference manual for an actual system. Oh, there's another one too. Um, So we have getting started on the Intellec 432-100, and we have the System 432-600. Let's go through IB, uh, Intel's one first. I'm getting major IBM vibes from this. I don't know why. This all just feels like something IBM would do. So... Let's go through the various chapters here. You can see that this is like not marketing because it's just kind of printed as if it was just printed out of a uh, regular printer and put into a binder. Yeah, IBM Energy. So it shows us the architecture again. We have, well, this system 432-600, there's memory controllers, storage arrays, um, all the different processes. Um, it's interesting to see here that, yeah, the system bus backplane handles memory controller, the storage array, the GDP, Oh, an interface processor, and you can add more storage or GDPs or interfaces. And then the interface processor uh, link um, and the interface processor connect to the multibus backplane, which handles, you know, attached processors or device controllers. So let's see. I believe we've already read a bit about this um, in the manager's uh, review. Um, so there's two backplanes. Um, I don't know if people here know what a backplane is. But a backplane is a whole bunch of stuff you plug stuff into and they talk on the same bus or something. Um, so it's kind of like an easy bus to talk to each other on. And you put the CPU on one and stuff on the other. Backplanes are planes that go backwards. Yes, very good. I think if you search up the Z80 backplane, yeah, if you can buy a, a Z80 homebrew computer called the RC2014, um, and you start with the backplane and then add some modules to it, like um, CPU, some memory, some EEPROM. And I guess the idea is that uh, instead of soldering, you just put little... Um, little slot stuff into it, like PCIe cards. 
probably cool. Um, love it. Um, and this has two back planes, one just for the 432 and all its modular processor stuff. And uh, the multibus black plane, which is for all the IO and stuff. So let's read this a bit more clearly. Um, the processor link cable connects the two planes together, like the um, interface processor link and the interface processor. So they don't have to be physically together, which is kind of interesting. Um, each processor and um, interface processor have its own clock. So some of them might be faster than another. That sounds kind of like hell. That's fine, I guess. A round robin architecture, so, uh, sorry, all the processors are able to access the memory by the system bus. And they use a round robin arbitration scheme. So everyone kind of gets equal access to be able to access the memory. That's pretty cool. Apparently you can access memory in uh, 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10 byte accesses. Which is a little strange, but I guess that makes sense. I don't get the 10 though, so 10 times 8 is what? 80? I suppose 80 works out for the floats, uh, the real numbers. Each storage array board contains logic to generate, check, and store a 7-bit error correction code for each 32-bit data word. Oh! So the storage arrays... What are the storage arrays? The storage arrays seem to be there for error checking. It's not there for like, um, device storage. I guess that has the actual memory on it, and then the memory controller talks to them. It talks about peripherals. It's gone dark in my room, um, probably because we, we're we deep into the IAPX 432. Um, wow, an 18 slot card cage. And there's a little picture here of uh, kind of a cute little um, cases. Now we get into the software. We have diagnostic software and it tests all the board types. Uh, it shows some sample configurations. Um, so figure 1.6 depicts the modularity and expansion. There are sample configurations for entry level, medium and large systems. So let's look at that. Oh, and it's just um, blurry pictures that I can't see. Um, some of them have more stuff. That's about it. Sorry, it talks about the amount of processes that may vary in a system from 2 to 6. Um, 
so they count the interface processes as a processor. Um, they talk about the backplanes. They have some pictures of. Is that for socketed memory? System bus backplane. No, that's just for for the stuff. For all the CPUs and whatever. All right, so now we get to see some logic boards. So what do we see here? A PC board form factor. Um, I guess that means printed circuit board form, fact, form factor. And it shows that it's like 12 inches by around 7 inches. Yeah, very grainy. Um, key slots are cut out in each connector, so you can't put them in wrong. That's pretty cool. Um, there's some jumpers, there's some cables for configuring stuff. Um, it tells you how much amp stuff are using, so like, my god. The GDP can do a max of 7 amps at 5 volts? Are you kidding me? That's 35 watts. Wow. And the other peripheral is like 5 amps or 6 amps. Printed circuit boards? Sounds hanky-panky as fuck. Uh, well... That's how things are. That's what they call them these days. Um, so we see some more suggested cage and backplane combinations. So they're really trying to tell us how to set these up. And the cases is just full of stuff in there. I can't see any room for airflow. I have no idea how you're going to cool this thing that probably uses more power than my computer could. A 750 watt 4 level switching power supply? Okay buddy. Alright, calm down. And now it shows us some buttons at the front, you can turn it on and off, you can select. Um, stuff. Very hard to see. Um, tells us about what happened if the power fails, I think. The cooling fans on the left side of the case blow air, blow, blow room air across the logic board. System logic boards in the cases are designed to operate to an ambient temperature range of 0 to 40 degrees Celsius. This thing can't go over 40? Oh no. What's my computer at now? 45? Oh. How? Oh. Not great. Not a fan of that. Okay, so we have some configuring, operating. It talks about memory interleaving. That's pretty cool. System memory sizes. Minimum memory sized is 64k. System memory sizes. I'm not sure how to read this. RAM size, so if you have 64k RAMs, then your minimum memory size is 512 byte, 512k, maximum is 2.5 megabytes, and you have to increment it in 512k. So basically, 
you have to add stuff in increments of 512k and not interleaved is 256k. There's a lot of talk about future expansion. That's pretty cool. It talks about um, memory per, uh, performance, like uh, it, a system will pro typically provide a four times performance increase between the entry level system with one GDP board and non interleaved memory and the maximum system with five GDP pods and interleaved memory. Um, it talks about the memory system can support as many processes until it like saturates the memory bandwidth. I just remembered something. Um, you know how I talked earlier about the risk machines that uh, came out of this project. Well, not came out of it. By the people that made this. The i960. Um, that, the people developing that uh, got folded into the Pentium Pro. Let's see if it says it here. Yeah. Um, that got folded into the Pentium Pro, which introduced the P6 microarchitecture of x86, which had speculative execution and cool performance and stuff like that. And um, that got mainlined as the Pentium 3. If I can find it. Pentium 3. Um, and that was then used for the um, core series. Uh, like, it went Pentium 3, then Pentium 4, then the Pentium 4 was so trash they dumped the design. And the Pentium 3 turned into the Core 2 series, which is pretty cool. So there you go. Let's continue on. It talks about selecting stuff. I gotta admit, there's a lot of talk about what to select when it's like, this is possibly the only board that's going to exist in the world. All right. So we have a block diagram of how the system actually works. So, we see the system bus, it has, uh, the memory subsystem has up to nine additional storage things, and that talks to the storage array and memory control boards. And then connected to that is the interface processor link board, the general data processor, and up to four additional GDP or IPL boards and the interface processor link links to the interface processor board that has you know attached processes and up to 10 additional boards um i mean it's a nice idea uh you can kind of get why you know the the solution here was to just put more and more stuff in a single chip and then attach that directly to the peripheral subsystem. Um, like a modern day IAPX 432 would have all of this on a single chip. And that'd be pretty cool. But alas. Um... On we go, looking through the reference. It looks at faults and it will direct me to the reference manual to understand those. What else is here?
Oh, so the chip itself doesn't actually... Yeah, so this is why it's not an actual chip, but it's a system on a module. It's that these all have multiple chips on them. Um, so the GDP, for example, has data rotation and storage unit, system buffs, buffering, clock generators, processor controllers, DRSU controllers, arbitration logic, and the system bus controller. Oh, the GDP probably has the clock generator in it, the actual 43201 chip. But yeah, it's a system on a module from what I can see. Architecture reference manual. Do we have that? Architecture reference manual. We'll have a look at that now. Because that goes further into detail about the architecture. Well, we'll look at the next, we'll look at the other machine next. After we get through this. Looking through stuff. The rest of it gets really into the details of it, but... Software interface implementation. And we have like kind of a uh, 2D graph of all the chips and then you have, sorry, all the modules and then they all have the multiple chips on them. And then they have interfaces that connect to them. So if we look back here, yeah, so the modules for the memory and the um, the GDP and the I, the IP or whatever, they have their own system bus uh, and control logic chips. That's cool. And that kind of explains what we have here. Block diagram of the actual system. It talks about error handling and diagnostics, but we don't really care that much about that. Um, because when let's face it, we're never going to have to troubleshoot this ever. Um, we have talk about the system performance, how you need to like actually measure performance by doing things. Um, the actual use case benchmarks are kind of not that great, which I agree with. What matters is like being actually able to um, do the thing you're doing at a good speed. And then we see this graph. And this kind of falls apart, I think. This is where everything kind of falls apart. So we have effective general data processes and then actual general data processes. So one processor is effectively one, two is effectively two, three is kind of 2.7, four is just a bit over three, and five is just a bit under four. So you start seeing some issues with concurrency here, because it turns out things just don't scale this way. You can't add more and more chips or cores to things. It doesn't work. Um, I think I've spelt this name right. Amdahl's Law. So you can kind of see perhaps the same kind of graph here. Yeah. So this graph here shows that the number of processes versus the speed up for how much of your program is parallelized. 
So how much of your program can be run in parallel? Because as much as you want your program to run in parallel, you always have to have some of it waiting or doing one thing. So if 50% of your program is parallel, um, let's see what the speed up is. You can get a two times speed up once you hit 16 processes if half your computer, half your program is fast, like parallel. 75% um, that maxes out around 256 processes with a four times speed up. And like if 95% of your program is parallel, then the maximum speed up you're going to get is 20 at 496 processes. So you cannot just add more processes, even if your stuff is parallel, um, just because um, it's the non-parallel stuff that is going to pull your performance down. It's not linear is the point. If you have two CPUs, things are not going to go twice as fast. Although this graph does say that. Um, it gets more complicated after that, obviously. And so we see the same type of thing here. The effective speed up, um, once you start getting to like, once you start having three processes, um, in order to have the actual speed of three processes, you need probably four processes. And then for four, you need five. And then the curve just flattens out after that, I bet. I bet that's why they're not showing it, to be perfectly honest, because you probably wouldn't want to show just a blank slate saying... Um, you're never going to get higher performance than that with uh, multitasking, uh, not multitasking, concurrency. Um, and again, that's not because like they're not running in parallel. That's just because the nature of an application is um, that's because the slowest part here is the memory, according to this. And since they have to wait for memory, eventually the memory becomes the bottleneck. At least I think that's what we get. Um, has automatic process scheduling. Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it says usually the bandwidth of the memory is the practical limitation. Um, since the processes have to wait when accessing memory. This is usually why processes use caches. Um, so each processor has its own little memory. And what happens is each processor, let's see if I can find a good diagram here. Yeah, memory hierarchy of some huge giant machine. Um, you have seven cores, and um, between them they have L1D and L1I um, cache for each two cores, and then you have L2 cache and L3 cache. And what happened? Oh, and then you have eight megabytes of cache at the top for each socket. And then you have memory, which is like 32 gigabytes or whatever. Um, or 16 gigabytes. You have this hierarchy of memory. And so whenever the CPU wants to be able to access memory, you have to pull all the way from memory when you can, when you have the time. And then when it's time to write back, you write to the cache. And then when then your computer, your process can keep going, but the cache can be written back at an opportune time. 
which is pretty cool. So that's why there's caches everywhere. That's why it's a big deal when they're like, more cash. Give me more cash. C-A-C-H-E for the captions. C-A-C-H-E. Okay, yeah. So, now let's look at the Ent Intellic 432-100. So, this is an evaluation and education system. It comes with the software, workspaces, um, the board that we were talking about before. Wait, is this the same board? I think this is a 600. Yeah, this is a smaller board, I'm guessing. And OPL programs. I don't know what OPL means, but it says OPL 432. So let's scroll down. It uses serial cables. Um, it has a, it has one board, object primers, and it has some disks containing system files and workspaces. Uh, it tells you how to install it. That's pretty cool. Is this just the installation guide? I think so. Um, it appears that the computer is entirely capital letters. Um, and it tells you to run some commands. Um, Oh no, it has, it has some lowercase letters. And it seems just like, um, you know, you do your object-oriented programming. So if anyone has one of these, yes please, send please. Oh, we have some interesting things here. Removing and adding components. So this is how you add and remove in the socket. Um, you kind of pry the metal part off and lift it up. So is that, hmm, there's no pins shown in this. So is that like press fit down? So if we search up Intellic 432100, It's nothing. There's only... There's only just the same manual. Is there any images of it? Not really. Is that an actual system of it? Let's visit it. Photos! There's photos! Let's look at these photos. Okay. The i single board computer 432. Or 432 100. And then that's all. And this is what it looks like. Um, I think this is the single computer, like this is everything just on one chip. So no backplanes or anything. Just a single board computer with the GDP and the IDP and some other stuff on it. And you could connect, I suppose, this to a multibus backplane or something. Perhaps, I'm not too sure. Um, Intel categories, Intel systems. Does this web page have a search? 
I don't think so. Oh, four, three, two. There's nothing. Um, what is this one? You don't really see the distinctive um, GDP or IP um, the things at the top there. Oh, and that's just the end of the, the um, that's just the end of the Google results. That's all of them. Okay. So, let us get on with it. We're now looking at the architecture reference manual. More stuff. Can I page down, please? Yes. And I guess at the start, we're going to have more talk about software systems, reliability, the semantic gap, and it shows us some nice, you know, how high level programs use data structures and stuff, while regular computers use just linear address. And Intel's idea here is to have the hardware kind of fuzz it a bit and say that things are actually like that. Talks about object protection. Um, are we going to scroll down? We get a little picture here actually of the architecture for the um, the IMAX 432 and the Silicon OS. Um, we see that the Silicon OS does IO, configuration, initialization, process scheduling and dispatching, memory management, then IMAX helps out, oh no, it doesn't, um, it does process communication and synchronization, object addressing and protection, and IMAX does things on top of those. Oops, it's a little bit worrying. Not a fan of that. Um, what if you want to schedule stuff differently? So it talks about um, the IMAX doesn't simply run on hardware that passively executes instructions. Um, so the hardware and software work together. Down we go. Tells us about the GDP and gives us another nice looking diagram. Um, all the operators. Does this have like a... Ah, I keep clicking the back button. Why? Why would they put it right there? It's not the way to put it. Okay, so this is just numbered for every page. Um, we're going to have to go back to the start and just look at the page numbers. Or oh, you might skip this documentation. Perhaps. What else do we have here? Let's skim the... Um... Uh, hardware part. Object addressing, no. Memory management, parallel processing. Processor management, instruction interface. 
that could be cool to look at, but this, yeah, yeah, we'll look at that, that's page, that's chapter 7, page 1, that's not helpful at all actually, that's not a page number that I can use. Oh, reference. This is a reference of all the stuff here. So we will probably want to look at. Yeah, chapter nine onwards. So let's just jump down here. And we can see a little bit of the APIs, I suppose. Um, let's go back to the bit savers stuff here um and i'm going to grab the operating system pdf and the opl stuff which we mentioned a little bit earlier There's two reference manuals for the GDP, so let's quickly open this one. Maybe it'll be, oh, this is a data sheet. Let's look at this. So it tells us the features of it. It has the, the pins. It has 64 pins, wow or at least that yeah 64. Um, it has a block diagram showing the instruction decoder it receives macro instructions processes variable length fields extracts logical addresses and then generates micro instructions that's similar to how the x86 system happens today with a front end that handles complex instructions and a back end that processes them in a risk way. Um, let's see. It has branching instructions. It has an uh, micro instruction sequencer and execution unit. Here we go. It's a block diagram of it. Right, that's a block diagram of 43202, and that's a block diagram of 43201. And I guess they work together. Yeah, here we go. So it's actually two chips that work together, I believe. Yeah, the 43201 and 43202. So it's not the interface thing, it's actually one chip. Um, it talks about the different ways you can um, access memory. Hardware error detection, physical stuff, requirements. Um, that is a figure of the processor packet bus. It's pretty cool. Um, it has the encoding. So it uses its own packet format. That's pretty cool. And it has all the timings and stuff there. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Um, all the pins. A lot of pins. Um, that's a fairly okay data sheet. It has all the operations.
That's pretty cool. I like that. And so this is the reference manual here that you would use if you were actually programming. I'm going to jump down there because I forgot what I was doing. And let us look at the IMAX system in a bit. And by a bit, I mean now. So the IMAX operating system um, what does it do? I think it just has some small applications. I don't think it's a Unix-like thing. I think it's just... Um, I think it's just like a real-time OS. Yeah, so there's two releases. There's IMAX version 2 which supersedes version 1, but the minimal version um, 2 is kind of like version 1. Um, it's designed to be independent of any particular programming language. Um, initially, Adder is the only programming language provided. Um, that's pretty cool. And it has some examples. That's going to be pretty cool to look at. And you can order some stuff. Not anymore. Let's go through the chapters. Oh my god, this is a lot of stuff. Um, so, what do we want to have a look at? Um... I think we want to just look at, is there, this looks like um, the API for the operating system. Um, let's see. I think I'd like to look at initialization here, but also it'd be good to look at just something basic. So let's look at, uh, IO. How would we do a hello world in IMAX? How to reference IMAX services? Um, there doesn't really seem to be anything about IO here. Oh no, IO, IO. Let's hit IO. Yeah, IO2. So let's just jump down and let's have a look here. Which page is this one in the general data reference thing? There is a lot of stuff here. Um, could you use this to build your own emulated IAPX 432? Um, probably. You, just, you shouldn't know. Should do better. So these are operators. Okay, I managed to jump into the IO stuff. And it's just adder code. Alright. I mean, it's standard stuff. All the, uh, all the complicated stuff, I suppose, is in the hardware. So let's jump back to that. Jump down a few hundred pages. Let's also look at the Object Programming Language User's Guide. Uh, 
So what is object programming language? It's an interactive, object-oriented language whose structure parallels many of the features of the IAPX432 object-based architecture. So it shares many features with Smalltalk, Logo, Simula, and to a certain extent, Lisp. So this is pretty cool. Um, and this is basically to kind of layer on top of the IAPX. What is that image? So you have a workspace, which I suppose is like small talk. Um, and you have objects in the workspace. You have kind of uh, workbenches and stuff. And a window is kind of a viewport. Um, and that kind of makes it a more friendly way of programming. And this is kind of basically kind of like small talk. Which is pretty cool. Um, it shows us the special stuff here. This would be all terminal based, wouldn't it? So it's telling you how to type stuff. And it has some basic commands like display grow to 2235 and that's how you make your display bigger so you can type stuff and watch it do we have any more screenshots uh, anti-disestablishmentarianism type and that gives you the length of it that's pretty cool um, i'm up for some anti-disestablishmentarianism Um, I like the, the, the type of environment there. Um, interactive development is always good. Um, it's how you get a good feedback loop going between the computer. And so this is a... Was the Intel OPL ported? Or was this just on the, uh, did this die with the APX? Oh no. Hacker News says that this is like small talk. Oh, my sweet boy, you're gone forever. <laughs> my baby boy, you may have taken a shitty, um, oh, there's hardware reference manuals. Let's click those. Um, you may have taken my crappy CPU that I hate, but you took a nice language too. Oh, this is beautiful. Oh, and it's all backed by like proper hardware too. This is the kind of thing that I, that I was looking for here. Imagine having this, but it's like secure and backed by actual objects on the hardware but also it's burned into EEPROM so you can't fix any hardware bugs <laughs> for what it's worth like um small talk uses a little virtual machine um if we look at two decades of small talk vm development um It uses a little virtual machine with um, snapshots and um, stuff. I'm getting mind blown by this. You can send messages and it would go to like actual things on the chip. 
Oh, I'm so sad. Oh, come back. Oh, it has, it has concatenation, I think. It's got like no dot CR, which would be like carriage return. Oh, it's got lambdas and like just tells you to repeat it. Oh, my boy. <laughs> what did they do with you? Oh. Ahead of its time. Well, no, um, just copying shit that existed. Uh. <laughs> but the thing that gets me with this, it's not that this is a good machine. It's that it was an interesting machine and it hasn't been preserved. It's gone forever. And it's cool. Oh, that's some schematics of the backplane. We don't need that. Hardware reference manual for the um, SBC we were looking at earlier. Is this interesting? Um, this there's a drawing. Oh, there's some uh, designs and drawings of the logic board. So let's have a look at this. Oh. That's a ton of bypass caps there. I don't think my computer's gonna, my internet's gonna be able to download this. There's just so much. Um, I wanted to see the, which page am I looking for? I wanna look for the general data processor logic board diagram, page 100, 132. So these are all the schematics, I guess, just for the um, 432-600 thing. I'm not saying anyone should make this, but I'm just saying the information is out there. You have a reference manual, you have a data sheet, um, you have various bus architectures. God. Um, let's jump down. I don't think there's going to be anything much more in the architecture reference for me. Okay, is this the GDP? No, it was at 132. So another 10 pages, please. Oh, look, at, okay. So process communication operators. So in Q message, it puts stuff in a list. DQ message. So what do the ops look like for, say, in Q? Uh, operand 1 is the access selector. Operand 2 is the access selector. So you have two access selectors. Um, and then you have the action, which I suppose is operand 3. That's pretty cool. I mean, I don't know what I expected. Look at these schematics. Eyes emoji. So this is the schematics for, I think, the GDP. Logic diagram. PWA. Um, yeah. So here we go. We have... I'm guessing this is the power page because it just has a million bypass capacitors. And then we have the the clock, the error signal interface. Those are the standard logic chips. Where's the GDP? Here's the GDP. Arbitration state machine. Those look kind of like fine. IPC logic. Yeah, there's a lot of 74 series chips around here. Uh, 
so these are a lot of logic buffering things. Discrete logic. Oh my god, there's a lot of discrete logic. There's so many discrete logics you don't understand. I just wanted to know where the GDP is. They're doing state machines and stuff. Processor request logic, misc logic. Processor state machine. Where is it? Where's the GDP chip? These all these schematics were written by hand, so I can't get too mad at not being able to search through them. Ah, four three two o one and four three two two o two and TTL clocks. But where's our boy? Our baby. Oh, that's the clock sprit. Here we go, and let's just connect it together. Yeah, I mean, I get you. I don't know what I expected. Um, and let's look at, lastly, let's look at the CDS workstation user's guide. Big stretch. And so this should have like the actual tutorial, uh, actual programs that you would use on, um, on what processor? Oh, for the cross development on the Intellic Series 3 microprocessor development system. And it has an overview of the stuff. And it tells us to like go look at stuff. So we'll do that in a little second. Hydrate? Fine. Is that lewd? I don't know. I don't know if I should have done that. Am I going to get banned from Twitch for drinking? <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry. Oh. I should just pour water over myself and change the category to hot tub stream. Alright. Let's look at the cross development system. So how do you actually develop for the 432? Um, using a host system like the Bax or BMS, you create and edit and compile stuff. Then you download it to the debug workstation, which is an Intellect Series 3 microcomputer development system. And that runs it on the 432670 execution vehicle. And then we have the Intellect Series 3. Let me search that up for us. No, that's a Series 2. What? But is there an actual... They have it at this, this collection. Oh, wait, no, this is like, I don't know what this is. What is this? I can't let me in. Okay. So this is what the Intellect Series 3 development system looks like. Friggin' fancy, actually. Look at that. 
sick blue computer connected up to a uh, monitor. Got them fam hands there. <laughs> Fanboy Friday when they took the picture. <laughs> I don't know why I'm implying that that's a man with fanboy hands. Like, imagine if the... I mean, it is the 80s, but it's like... 1980, we have to take a picture or draw something. Let's do some sick fanboy hands. Nah, it's just woman hands, I think. It's drawn, I think. I'm not sure. I always see these old pictures. And I'm like, is this taken as a photo? How did they get photos to look like that? And I guess it's just like airbrushed. But I really do love how they put put the um, flare effect on stuff just to make it look really shiny. Like, if there's any art style that should come back, it should come back. So that should come back. It should be like this, you know, we're using a computer and... It's colourful and shiny, and in the back it's just abstract. And they've got a picture of a globe at the top. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so let's look through this. This might be a better manual to look at than this, which is a workstation user's guide. Although, we'll, we'll have a look. The Intellect Series 3 mini computer development system is more than a keyboard, a video display, an integral disk drive, and a box of two microprocessors. It is a useful tool for designing microcomputer software for the IAPX86-88 processor family, or for the 8080 or 85. Um, and then it has in-circuit emulation. So this is more for... 8886 stuff, but I guess Intel's like, what? Why do you have climate? Okay, so it's a, pro it's a programming tutorial, and it's like, make some graphs, choose your tools, Probably more helpful than basically any programming tutorials out there for languages, to be honest. Like, explaining to you the process at the start. It's like, okay, you should break the problem down into solvable tasks. Yeah. Good idea. Um, and then it shows you directories and stuff. What OS does this run? The ISIS 2 operating system. I'm, I'm getting off track here. I'm sorry. This is getting into like actual things that exist that people used. I mean, that looks pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. That keyboard, though. Oh, I don't want that. Look at that. What is that? No control keys? No shift key? What has a shift key? I don't know. This arrow, this arrow is sus, though. Is that an arrow section? You have up, down, left, right, down, and then under that is two buttons. What is that, like, four-dimensional stuff? In, out? And you got some really sick, cool stuff on the screen over there. It's got colors, so you know it's good. And you have this, this screen, this monitor over here that looks like it should be from, like, the 1998s. 1998s. Oh, and they've just got this crappy cable going to the floor. Oh, it's horrible. Just going to that poor computer. Okay, I'm getting distracted. Um, but apparently this has been somewhat saved. Anyway, if we go back to this document, <coughs> which, to be honest, let's just download it.
use a proper program to read it. I thought buying a faster computer would help me read PDFs faster, but apparently not. Okay, where are we going? So the debug workstation has the microcomputer development system that will allow you to debug stuff and then execute it. Let's go down here. It tells you how to use the debug 432 program. Breakpoints. It's interesting to look at how things were debugged because it's not just standard you know, stop the machine and get a bit of light in here. Stop the machine and then read all the memory. No, this is special. So, the Series 3 has two execution modes the 8080 mode under control of ISIS 2. And the 8086 mode under control of run 8086. So you have to run the debug 432 program. And it has a work file and you have to go to the... Set up your drives and stuff and set the month and the date and the year. And the year is two digits because, you know... When would you ever be living in a pathetic timeline where you're past the year 2000? <laughs> Sorry, past the year 1999. Pathetic. The cursed timeline, I'm guessing. We go back in time only to be bullied over like our date formats. What, you're from 21? <laughs> Pathetic. And I'm just yelling at them like, there's been so many centuries before you. There's been so many. Why are you, why are you choosing the 9090? Like, why? There's been so many. There's the 18s, there's the 17s. There's also negative stuff. You can't, you got any... <laughs> I'm getting in an actual argument with someone that doesn't exist over something that could never happen. so defensive over something that is impossible. Okay. So physical addressing is allowed. Um, they explain more of that in chapter 4. Let's scroll down. Symbols, standard debug stuff. I mean, this is more debug you get than freaking x86. You know, at least at least this has a debugger. I don't have a hardware debugger on my computer. Intel 42 cross development system. Hang on. Do they have? Do they have that? Whoa, what happened to this page? Cross, cross, cross development. Huh. Let's search that up actually. I would like to see the Intel 432 cross development system guide. Nope, doesn't exist. Probably in someone's bookshelf somewhere. Or maybe like they died and their relatives threw all their Intel A APX stuff out. It's so morbid and horrible. Um, so here we talk about templates. <laughs> Definitely did that. You think, like, everyone involved who built the machines has, like, passed away and the relatives come in and are like, 
what's this trash? And they just throw it in the bin. We can't find it online. We can't sell this. What's the market price for this? Ugh, awful. Awful, awful, awful. Okay. So, templates to examine and modify objects in the memory image. A template describes how the data in an object is organized in memory and how that information should be displayed when the user examines the object. So, I'm guessing this is just like a list of the things that are in memory. Like, it, it has an example here. Um, a template context as is, and it has a contact context data segment at offset zero, const for the constants data segment at offset one, previous is the calling context at offset two, message is the next one at offset three, and you just specify these data structures and then you can access them. That makes sense to me. So it comes with few templates, one for access descriptors, one for two rows of access descriptors, different values of numbers, like 16 bits unsigned values. Um, uses a variant to select the correct template to display any object table entry. Um, and the following templates are used in defining those above. ASCII, dump, free, header, interconnect, descriptors. And then you have references. So it uses, instead of memory addresses, it uses um, segments and offsets. And it has a weird kind of syntax for it. So, segment 9, uh, I have never needed to remember, oh, 5 carat, sorry, 9 carat 9, and there's 21 carat 3.12, which like, come on, segment 21 carat 3, starting at offset 12, um, that, uh, I'm not missing it. I'm not, like, I'm not missing not having segments. Sorry, I'm not missing having segments. Um, and using templates, you can uh, define expressions and then just type them, I guess, and chain them. Which is cool, I guess. And you can traverse descriptors. Basically, just follow and move around in memory. I like that. That's cool. You can examine the hardware memory. That's cool, too. It uses segments, too. So you can just examine the bytes and whatever. You can modify memory. Gives you a big warning about when you modify things. If you don't add the um, offset, it will modify everything there at that segment. And it goes into like a lot of syntax to uh, describe how to um, access fields. You can monitor the processes. So like um you can see call stacks of context. You can look at, you can add breakpoints um, on a per process and per context um, granularity. I think that's about it. 
like um this is very very dry even for me um and it's just telling you how to use the debugger and it doesn't look to be anything really interesting it's just like it's a regular debugger but it uses like different um addressing schemes Um, I'd probably hate to use this debugger. Um, let's look for, I think in this it has update. There's a tool to update stuff. Part 2, update 432. Let the user quickly revise the linked object description when the add a source program has been modified on the mainframe host. So is this like hot reloading? So it divide so adder can divide programs into modules. The linker combines things separately to make a single file. Um, since the bandwidth between the mainframe and the series three is limited, you want to reduce the amount of redundant information. So using update 432, you don't have to download the entire newly linked program. You own only the revision um, ED you need to be sent. So it just includes the changes. That's pretty cool. And I think that's all. That's everything to do with the APX 432. At least all the interesting stuff. Um, I just want to know where it went. Where'd you go, APX? Where'd you go, buddy? So, that's it. I hope you liked this stream. Um, sayonara. Do you have anything to add, Kaz? How a baby is born. You see, when one CPU microarchitecture and another CPU microarchitecture.